Emma Woodhouse, handsome, clever, and rich, with a comfortable home and happy disposition, seemed to unite some of the best blessings of existence, and had lived nearly twenty-one years in the world with very little to distress or vex her. She was the youngest of the two daughters of a most affectionate, indulgent father, and had, in consequence of her sister's marriage, been mistress of his house from a very early period. Her mother had died too long ago for her to have more than an indistinct remembrance of her caresses, and her place had been supplied by an excellent woman as governess, who had fallen little short of a mother in affection. Sixteen years had Miss Taylor been in Mr. Woodhouse's family, less as a governess than as a friend, very fond of both daughters, but particularly of Emma. Between them it was more than the intimacy of sisters. Even before Miss Taylor had ceased to hold the nominal office of governess, the mildness of her temper had hardly allowed her to impose any restraint and the shadow of her authority being now long passed away they had been living together as friend and friend very mutually attached and emma doing just what she liked highly esteeming miss taylor's judgment but directed chiefly by her own the real evils, indeed, of Emma's situation were the power of having rather too much her own way, and a disposition to think a little too well of herself. These were the disadvantages which threatened alloy to her many enjoyments. The danger, however, was at present so unperceived that they did not by any means rank as misfortunes to her. Sorrow came, a gentle sorrow, but not at all in the shape of any disagreeable consciousness. Miss Taylor married. It was Miss Taylor's loss which first brought grief. It was on the wedding day of this beloved friend that Emma first sat in mournful thought of any continuance. The wedding over and the bride-people gone, her father and herself were left to dine together, with no prospect of a third to cheer a long evening. Her father composed himself to sleep after dinner as usual, and she had then only to sit and think of what she had lost. The event had every promise of happiness for her friend. Mr. Weston was a man of unexceptionable character easy fortune, suitable age, and pleasant manners, and there was some satisfaction in considering with what self-denying, generous friendship she had always wished and promoted the match. But it was a black morning's work for her. The want of Miss Taylor would be felt every hour of every day. She recalled her past kindness, the kindness, the affection of sixteen years, how she had taught and how she had played with her from five years old, how she had devoted all her powers to amuse and attach her in health, and how nursed her through the various illnesses of childhood. A large debt of gratitude was owing here, but the intercourse of the last seven years, the equal footing and perfect unreserve which had soon followed Isabella's marriage, on their being left to each other, was yet a dearer, tenderer recollection. She had been a friend and companion such as few possessed, intelligent, well-informed, useful, gentle, knowing all the ways of the family, interested in all its concerns, and, peculiarly, interested in herself, in every pleasure, every scheme of hers, one to whom she could speak every thought as it arose, and who had such an affection for her as could never find fault. How was she to bear the change? It was true that her friend was only half a mile from them, but Emma was aware that great must be the difference between a Mrs. Weston only half a mile from them and a Miss Taylor in the house, and with all her advantages, natural and domestic, she was now in great danger of suffering from intellectual solitude. She dearly loved her father, but he was no companion for her. He could not meet her conversation, rational or playful. 
the evil of the actual disparity in their ages and mr woodhouse had not married early was much increased by his constitution and habits for having been a valetudinarian all his life without activity of mind or body he was a much older man in many ways than in years and though everywhere beloved for the friendliness of his heart and his amiable temper his talents could not have recommended him at any time her sister though comparatively but little removed by matrimony being settled in london only sixteen miles off was much beyond her daily reach and many a long november and october evening must be struggled through at hartfield before christmas brought the next visit from isabella and her husband and their little children to fill the house and give her pleasant society again highbury the large and populous village almost amounting to a town to which hartfield in spite of its separate lawn the shrubberies and name did really belong afforded her no equals the woodhouses were first in consequence there all looked up to them she had many acquaintance in the place for her father was universally civil but not one among them who could be accepted in lieu of miss taylor for even half a day it was a melancholy change and emma could not but sigh over it and wish for impossible things till her father awoke and made it necessary to be cheerful his spirits required support he was a nervous man easily depressed fond of everybody that he was used to and hating to part with them hating change of every kind matrimony as the origin of change was always disagreeable and he was by no means yet reconciled to his own daughter's marrying nor could ever speak of her but with compassion though it had been entirely a match of affection when he was now obliged to part with miss taylor too and from his habits of gentle selfishness and of being never able to suppose that other people could feel differently from himself he was very much disposed to think miss taylor had done as sad a thing for herself as for them and would have been a great deal happier if she had spent all the rest of her life at hartfield Emma smiled and chatted as cheerfully as she could to keep him from such thoughts, but when tea came it was impossible for him not to say exactly as he had said at dinner. "'Poor Miss Taylor! I wish she were here again. What a pity it is that Mr. Weston ever thought of her!' i cannot agree with you papa you know i cannot mr weston is such a good-humoured pleasant excellent man that he thoroughly deserves a good wife and you would not have had miss taylor live with us for ever and bear all my odd humours when she might have a house of her own a house of her own but what is the advantage of a house of her own this is three times as large and you have never any odd humours my dear how often we shall be going to see them and they coming to see us we shall be always meeting we must begin we must go and pay wedding visit very soon my dear how am i to get so far randall's is such a distance i could not walk half so far no papa nobody thought of your walking we must go in the carriage to be sure the carriage but jane will not like to put the horses to for such a little way and where are the poor horses to be while we are paying our visit they will be put up into mr weston's stable papa you know we have settled all that already we talked it over with mr weston last night and as for james you may be very sure he will always like going to randall's because of his daughter's being housemaid there i only doubt whether he will ever take us any place else that was your doing papa you got hannah that good place nobody thought of hannah till you mentioned her james is so obliged to you i am very glad i did think of her it was very lucky for i would not have had poor james think himself slighted upon any account and i am sure she will make a very good servant she is a civil pretty-spoken girl i have a great opinion of her whenever i see her she always curtsies and asks me how i do in a very pretty manner 
and when you have had her here to do needlework i always observe she turns the lock of the door the right way and never bangs it i am sure she will be an excellent servant and it will be a great comfort to poor miss taylor to have somebody about her that she is used to whenever james goes over to see his daughter you know she will be hearing of us he will be able to tell her how we all are emma spared no exertions to maintain this happier flow of ideas and hoped by the help of backgammon to get her father tolerably through the evening and be attacked by no regrets but her own the backgammon table was placed but a visitor immediately afterwards walked in and made it unnecessary mr knightley a sensible man about seven or eight and thirty was not only a very old and intimate friend of the family but particularly connected with it as the elder brother of isabella's husband he lived about a mile from highbury was a frequent visitor and always welcome and at this time more welcome than usual as coming directly from their mutual connections in london he had returned to a late dinner after some days absence and now walked up to hartfield to say that all were well in brunswick square it was a happy circumstance and animated mr woodhouse for some time mr knightley had a cheerful manner which always did him good and his many inquiries after poor isabella and her children were answered most satisfactorily when this was over mr woodhouse gratefully observed it is very kind of you mr knightley to come out at such a late hour to call upon us i am afraid you must have had a shocking walk not at all sir it is a beautiful moonlight night and so mild that i must draw back from your great fire but you must have found it very damp and dirty i wish you may not catch cold dirty sir look at my shoes not a speck on them well that is quite surprising for we have had a great deal of rain here it rained dreadfully hard for half an hour while we were at breakfast i wanted them to put off the wedding by the by i have not wished you joy being pretty well aware of what sort of joy you must both be feeling i have been in no hurry with my congratulations but i hope it all went off tolerably well how did you all behave who cried most ah poor miss taylor tis a sad business poor mr and miss woodhouse if you please but i cannot possibly say poor miss taylor i have a great regard for you and emma but when it comes to the question of dependence or independence at any rate it must be better to have only one to please than two especially when one of those two is such a fanciful troublesome creature cried emma playfully that is what you have in your head i know and what you would certainly say if my father were not by i believe it is very true my dear indeed said mr woodhouse with a sigh i am afraid i am sometimes very fanciful and troublesome my dearest papa you do not think i could mean you or suppose mr knightley to mean you what a horrible idea oh no i meant only myself mr knightley loves to find fault with me you know in a joke it's all a joke we always say what we like to each other mr knightley in fact was one of the few people who could see faults in emma woodhouse and the only one who ever told her of them and though this was not particularly agreeable to emma herself she knew it would be so much less so to her father that she would not have him really suspect such a circumstance as her not being thought perfect by everybody emma knows i never flatter her said mr knightley but i meant no reflection on anybody miss taylor has been used to have two persons to please she will now have but one the chances are that she must be a gainer well said emma willing to let it pass you want to hear about the wedding and i shall be happy to tell you for we all behaved charmingly everybody was punctual everybody in their best looks not a tear and hardly a long face to be seen oh no we all felt that we were going to be only half a mile apart and were sure of meeting every day dear emma bears everything so well said her father 
But, Mr. Knightley, she really is very sorry to lose poor Miss Taylor, and I am sure she will miss her more than she thinks for. Emma turned her head away, divided between tears and smiles. It is impossible that Emma should not miss such a companion, said Mr. Knightley. We should not like her so well as we do, sir, if we could suppose it. But she knows how much the marriage is to Miss Taylor's advantage. She knows how very acceptable it must be at Miss Taylor's time of life to be settled in a home of her own, and how important to her to be secure of a comfortable provision, and therefore cannot allow herself to feel so much pain as pleasure. Every friend of Miss Taylor must be glad to have her so happily married." "'And you have forgotten one matter of joy to me,' said Emma, "'and a very considerable one, that I made the match myself. "'I made the match, you know, four years ago, "'and to have it take place and be proved in the right "'when so many people said Mr. Weston could never marry again "'may comfort me for anything.' "'Mr. Knightley shook his head at her. "'Her father fondly replied, "'Ah, my dear, I wish you would not make matches and foretell things, "'for whatever you say always comes to pass. "'Pray do not make any more matches.' "'I promise you to make none for myself, papa, "'but I must indeed for other people. "'It is the greatest amusement in the world, "'and after such success, you know, "'everybody said Mr. Weston would never marry again.' "'Oh, dear, no! Mr. Weston, who had been a widower for so long, and who seemed so perfectly comfortable without a wife, so constantly occupied either in his business in town or among his friends here, always acceptable wherever he went, always cheerful. Mr. Weston need not spend a single evening in the year alone if he did not like it. Oh, no!' Mr. Weston certainly would never marry again. Some people even talked of a promise to his wife on her deathbed, and others of the son and the uncle not letting him. All manner of solemn nonsense was talked on the subject, but I believed none of it. Ever since the day about four years ago that Miss Taylor and I met him in Broadway Lane, when, because it began to drizzle, he darted away with so much gallantry, and borrowed two umbrellas for us from Farmer Mitchell's, I made up my mind on the subject. I planned the match from that hour, and when such success has blessed me in this instance, dear Papa, you cannot think that I shall leave off matchmaking. "'I do not understand what you mean by success,' said Mr. Knightley. "'Success supposes endeavour. "'Your time has been properly and delicately spent, "'if you have been endeavouring for the last four years "'to bring about this marriage, "'a worthy employment for a young lady's mind. "'But if, when I rather imagine, "'your making the match, as you call it, "'means only your planning it, you're saying to yourself one idle day, I think it would be a very good thing for Miss Taylor if Mr. Weston were to marry her, and saying it again to yourself every now and then afterwards, why do you talk of success? Where is your merit? What are you proud of? You made a lucky guess, and that is all that can be said. And have you never known the pleasure and triumph of a lucky guess? I pity you. I thought you cleverer, for depend upon it a lucky guess is never merely luck. There is always some talent in it, and as to my poor word success, which you quarrel with, I do not know that I am so entirely without any claim of it. You have drawn two pretty pictures, but I think there may be a third, a something between the do-nothing and the do-all. If I had not promoted Mr. Weston's visits here, and given many little encouragements and smoothed many little matters, it might not have come to anything after all. I think you must know Hartfield enough to comprehend that. A straightforward, open-hearted man like Weston, and a rational, unaffected woman like Miss Taylor, may be safely left to manage their own concerns. You are more likely to have done harm to yourself than good to them by interference. "'Emma never thinks of herself if she can do good for others,' rejoined Mr. Woodhouse, understanding but in part. 
"'But, my dear, pray do not make any more matches. "'They are silly things and break up one's family circle grievously.' "'Only one more, Papa, only Mr. Elton. "'Poor Mr. Elton. "'You like Mr. Elton, Papa. "'I must look about for a wife for him. "'There is nobody in Highbury who deserves him, "'and he has been here a whole year, "'and has fitted up his house so comfortably "'that it would be a shame to have him single any longer, "'and I thought when he was joining their hands to-day "'he looked so very much as if he would like to have "'the same kind office done for him.' I think very well of Mr. Elton, and this is the only way I have of doing him a service. Mr. Elton is a very pretty young man, to be sure, and a very good young man, and I have a great regard for him. But if you want to show him any attention, my dear, ask him to come and dine with us some day. That will be a better thing. I dare say Mr. Knightley will be so kind as to meet him. "'With a great deal of pleasure, sir, at any time,' said Mr. Knightley, laughing, "'and I agree with you entirely that it will be a much better thing. "'Invite him to dinner, Emma, and help him to the best of the fish and the chicken, "'but leave him to choose his own wife. "'Depend on it. "'A man of six or seven and twenty can take care of himself.'" End of chapter 1 Emma by Jane Austen Chapter 2 Mr. Weston was a native of Highbury and born of a respectable family, which for the last two or three generations had been rising into gentility and property. He had received a good education, but on succeeding early in life to a small independence had become indisposed for any of the more homely pursuits in which his brothers were engaged, and had satisfied an active, cheerful mind and social temper by entering into the militia of his county, then embodied. Captain Weston was a general favourite, and when the chances of his military life had introduced him to Miss Churchill, of a great Yorkshire family, and Miss Churchill fell in love with him, nobody was surprised except her brother and his wife, who had never seen him, and who were full of pride and importance which the connection would offend. Miss Churchill, however, being of age, and with the full command of her fortune, though her fortune bore no proportion to the family estate, was not to be dissuaded from the marriage, and it took place to the infinite mortification of Mr. and Mrs. Churchill, who threw her off the due decorum. It was an unsuitable connection, and it did not produce much happiness. Mrs. Weston ought to have found more in it, for she had a husband whose warm heart and sweet temper made him think everything due to her in return for the great goodness of being in love with him. But though she had one sort of spirit, she had not the best. She had resolution enough to pursue her own will in spite of her brother, but not enough to refrain from unreasonable regrets at that brother's unreasonable anger, nor from missing the luxuries of her former home. They lived beyond their income, but still it was nothing in comparison to Enscombe. She did not cease to love her husband, but she wanted at once to be the wife of Captain Weston and Miss Churchill of Enscombe. Captain Weston, who had been considered, especially by the Churchills, as making such an amazing match, was proved to have much the worse of the bargain. For when his wife died after a three years' marriage, he was rather a poorer man than at first, and with a child to maintain. From the expense of the child, however, he was soon relieved. The boy had, with the additional softening claim of a lingering illness of his mother's, been the sort of reconciliation, and Mr. and Mrs. Churchill, having no children of their own, nor any other young creature of equal kindred to care for, offered to take the whole charge of the little Frank soon after her decease. Some scruples and some reluctance the widow or father may be supposed to have felt, but as they were overcome by other considerations, the child was given up to the care and the wealth of the Churchills, and he had only his own comfort to seek and his own situation to improve as he could. A complete change of life became desirable. 
he quitted the militia and engaged in trade, having brothers already established in a good way in London, which afforded him a favourable opening. It was a concern which brought just employment enough. He had still a small house in Highbury, where most of his leisure days were spent, and between useful occupation and the pleasures of society the next eighteen or twenty years of his life passed cheerfully away. He had by that time realized an easy competence, enough to secure the purchase of a little estate adjoining Highbury, which he had always longed for, enough to marry a woman as portionless even as Miss Taylor, and to live according to the wishes of his own friendly and social disposition. It was now some time since Miss Taylor had begun to influence his schemes, but as it was not the tyrannic influence of youth on youth, it had not shaken his determination of never settling till he could purchase Randall's, and the sale of Randall's was long looked forward to. But he had gone steadily on, and these objects in view, till they were accomplished. He had made his fortune, bought his house, and obtained his wife, and was beginning a new period of existence with every probability of greater happiness than in any yet passed through. He had never been an unhappy man. His own temper had secured him from that, even in his first marriage, but a second must show him how delightful a well-judging and truly amiable woman could be, and must give him the pleasantest proof of its being a great deal better to choose than to be chosen to excite gratitude than to feel it. He had only himself to please in his choice. His fortune was his own, for as to Frank it was more than being tacitly brought up as his uncle's heir. It had become so avowed an adoption as to have him assume the name of Churchill on coming of age. It was most unlikely, therefore, that he should ever want his father's assistance. His father had no apprehension of it. The aunt was a capricious woman, and governed her husband entirely, but it was not in Mr. Weston's nature to imagine that any caprice could be strong enough to affect one so dear, and as he believed so deservedly dear. He saw his son every year in London, and was proud of him, and his fond report of him as a very fine young man had made Highbury feel a sort of pride in him, too. He was looked on as sufficiently belonging to the place to make his merits and prospects of a kind of common concern. Mr. Frank Churchill was one of the boasts of Highbury, and a lively curiosity to see him prevailed, though the compliment was so little returned that he had never been out there in his life. His coming to visit his father had been talked of, but never achieved. Now, upon his father's marriage, it was very generally proposed as a most proper attention that this visit should take place. There was not a dissentient voice on the subject, either when Mrs. Perry drank tea with Mrs. and Miss Bates, or when Mrs. and Miss Bates returned the visit. Now was the time for Mr. Frank Churchill to come among them and the hope strengthened when it was understood that he had written to his new mother on the occasion. For a few days every morning visit in Highbury included some mention of the handsome letter Mrs. Weston had received. I suppose you have heard of the handsome letter Mr. Frank Churchill has written to Mrs. Weston. I understand it a very handsome letter indeed. Mr. Woodhouse told me of it. Mr. Woodhouse saw the letter, and he says he never saw such a handsome letter in his life. It was indeed a highly prized letter. Mrs. Weston had, of course, formed a very favourable idea of the young man, and such a pleasing attention was an irresistible proof of his great good sense, and a most welcome to every source and every expression of congratulation which her marriage had already secured. She felt herself a most fortunate woman, and she had lived long enough to know how fortunate she might well be thought, where the only regret was for a partial separation from friends whose friendship for her had never cooled, and who could ill bear to part with her. 
She knew that at times she must be missed and could not think without pain of Emma's losing a single pleasure or suffering an hour's ennui from the want of her companionableness. But dear Emma was of no feeble character. She was no more equal to her situation than most girls would have been, and had sense and energy in spirits that might be hoped would bear her well and happily through its little difficulties and privations. And then there was such comfort in the very easy distance of Randalls from Hartfield, so convenient for even solitary female walking, and in Mr. Weston's disposition and circumstances, which would make the approaching season no hindrance to their spending half the evenings in the week together. Her situation was altogether the subject of hours of gratitude to Mrs. Weston, and of moments only of regret, in her satisfaction, her more than satisfaction, her cheerful enjoyment, was so just and so apparent that Emma, well as she knew her father, was sometimes taken by surprise at his being able to pity poor Miss Taylor when they left her at Randall's in the centre of every domestic comfort, or saw her go away in the evening attended by her pleasant husband to a carriage of her own. But never did she go without Mr. Woodhouse's giving a gentle sigh, and saying, Ah, poor Miss Taylor, she would be very glad to stay. There was no recovering Miss Taylor, nor much likelihood of ceasing to pity her, but a few weeks brought some alleviation to Mr. Woodhouse. The compliments of his neighbours were over. He was no longer teased by being wished joy of so sorrowful an event, and the wedding-cake, which had been a great distress to him, was all eat up. His own stomach could bear nothing rich, and he could never believe other people to be different from himself. What was unwholesome to him he regarded as unfit for anybody and he had, therefore, earnestly tried to dissuade them from having any wedding-cake at all, and when that proved vain, as earnestly tried to prevent anybody's eating it, he had been at the pains of consulting Mr. Perry, the apothecary, on the subject. Mr. Perry was an intelligent, gentleman-like man, whose frequent visits were one of the comforts of Mr. Woodhouse's life, and upon being applied to he could not but acknowledge, though it seemed rather against the bias of inclination, that wedding-cake might certainly disagree with many, perhaps with most people, unless taken moderately. With such an opinion, in confirmation of his own, Mr. Woodhouse hoped to influence every visitor of the newly married pair, but still the cake was eaten, and there was no rest for his benevolent nerves till it was all gone. There was a strange rumour in Highbury of all the little Perrys being seen with a slice of Mrs. Weston's wedding-cake in their hands, but Mr. Woodhouse would never believe it. End of chapter 2 Emma by Jane Austen Chapter 3 Mr. Woodhouse was fond of society in his own way. He liked very much to have his friends come and see him, and from various united causes, from his long residence at Hartfield, and his good nature from his fortune, his house, and his daughter, he could command the visits of his own little circle in a great measure, as he liked. He had not much intercourse with any families beyond that circle. His horror of late hours and large dinner-parties made him unfit for any acquaintance, but such as would visit him on his own terms. Fortunately for him, Highbury, including Randalls in the same parish, and Donwell Abbey in the parish adjoining, the seat of Mr. Knightley, comprehended many such. Not unfrequently, through Emma's persuasion, he had some of the chosen and the best to dine with him but evening parties were what he preferred, and unless he fancied himself at any time unequal to company, there was scarcely an evening in the week in which Emma could not make up a card-table for him. Real long-standing regard brought the Westons and Mr. Knightley, and by Mr. Elton, a young man living alone without liking it, the privilege of exchanging any vacant evening of his own blank solitude for the elegancies and society of Mr. Woodhouse's drawing-room, and the smiles of his lovely daughter, was in no danger of being thrown away.
After these came a second set, among the most come at Abel, of whom were Mrs. and Miss Bates, and Mrs. Goddard, three ladies almost always at the service of an invitation from Hartfield, and who were fetched and carried home so often, that Mr. Woodhouse thought it no hardship for either James or the horses. Had it taken place only once a year, it would have been a grievance." Mrs. Bates, the widow of a former vicar of Highbury, was a very old lady, almost past everything but tea. She lived with her single daughter in a very small way, and was considered with all the regard and respect which a harmless old lady, under such untoward circumstances, can excite. Her daughter enjoyed a most uncommon degree of popularity for a woman neither young, handsome, rich, nor married. Miss Bates stood in the very worst predicament in the world for having much of the public favour, and she had no intellectual superiority to make atonement to herself, or frighten those who might hate her into outward respect. She had never boasted either beauty or cleverness, her youth had passed without distinction, and her middle of life was devoted to the care of a failing mother, and the endeavour to make a small income go as far as possible and yet she was a happy woman, and a woman whom no one named without good will. It was her own universal good will and contented temper which worked her. She loved everybody, was interested in everybody's happiness, quick-sighted to everybody's merits, thought herself a most fortunate creature, and surrounded with blessings in such an excellent mother, and so many good neighbours and friends, and a home that wanted for nothing. The simplicity and cheerfulness of her nature, her contented and graceful spirit, were a recommendation to everybody, and a mine of felicity to herself. She was a great talker upon little matters, which exactly suited Mr. Woodhouse, full of trivial communications and harmless gossip. Mrs. Goddard was the mistress of a school, not of a seminary or an establishment or anything which professed, in long sentences of refined nonsense, to combine liberal acquirements with elegant morality, upon new principles and new systems, and where young ladies for enormous pay might be screwed out of health and into vanity, but a real honest old-fashioned boarding-school where a reasonable quantity of accomplishments were sold at a reasonable price, and where girls might be sent to be out of the way and scramble themselves into a little education without any danger of coming back prodigies. Mrs. Goddard's school was in high repute and very deservedly, for Highbury was reckoned a particularly healthy spot. She had an ample house and garden, gave the children plenty of wholesome food, let them run about a great deal in the summer, and in winter dressed their chilblains with her own hands. It was no wonder that a train of twenty young couple now walked after her to church. She was a plain motherly kind of woman, who had worked hard in her youth and now thought herself entitled to the occasional holiday of a tea visit, and having formerly owed much to Mr. Woodhouse's kindness, felt his particular claim on her to leave her neat parlour, hung around with fancy work whenever she could, and win or lose a few sixpences by his fireside. These were the ladies whom Emma found herself very frequently able to collect, and happy was she for her father's sake in the power, though, as far as she herself concerned, it was no remedy for the absence of Mrs. Weston. She was delighted to see her father look comfortable, and very much pleased with herself for contriving things so well but the quiet prosings of three such women made her feel that every evening so spent was indeed one of the long evenings she had fearfully anticipated. As she sat one morning, looking forward to exactly such a close of the present day, a note was brought from Mrs. Goddard, requesting in most respectful terms to be allowed to bring Miss Smith with her, a most welcome request, for Miss Smith was a girl of seventeen who Emma knew very well by sight, and had long felt an interest in on account of her beauty. A very gracious invitation was returned, and the evening no longer dreaded by the fair mistress of the mansion. 
Harriet Smith was the natural daughter of somebody. Somebody had placed her several years back at Mrs. Goddard's school, and somebody had lately raised her from the condition of scholar to that of parlor boarder. This was all that was generally known of her history. She had no visible friends but what had been acquired in Highbury, and was now just returned from a long visit in the country to some young ladies who had been at school there with her. She was a very pretty girl, and her beauty happened to be of a sort which Emma particularly admired. She was short, plump, and fair, with a fine bloom, blue eyes, light hair, regular features, and a look of great sweetness. And, before the end of the evening, Emma was as much pleased with her manners as her person, and quite determined to continue the acquaintance. She was not struck by anything remarkably clever in Miss Smith's conversation, but she found her altogether very engaging, not inconveniently shy, not unwilling to talk, and yet so far from pushing, showing so proper, and becoming a deference, seeming so pleasantly grateful for being admitted to Hartfield, and so artlessly impressed by the appearance of everything in so superior a style to which she had been used to, that she must have good sense and deserve encouragement. Encouragement should be given. Those soft blue eyes and all those natural graces should not be wasted on the inferior society of Highbury and its connections. The acquaintance she had already formed were unworthy of her. The friends from whom she had just parted, though very good sort of people, must be doing her harm. They were a family of the name Martin, whom Emma knew well by character as renting a large farm of Mr. Knightley, and residing in the parish of Donwell, very creditably, she believed. She knew Mr. Knightley thought highly of them, but they must be coarse and unpolished, and very unfit to be the intimates of a girl who wanted only a little more knowledge and elegance to be quite perfect. She would notice her. She would improve her. She would detach her from her bad acquaintance and introduce her into good society. She would form her opinions and her manners. It would be an interesting and certainly a very kind undertaking, highly becoming her own situation in life, her leisure and powers. She was so busy in admiring those soft blue eyes, in talking and listening, and forming all these schemes in the in-betweens, that the evening flew away at a very unusual rate, and the supper-table, which always closed such parties, and for which she had been used to sit and watch the due time, was all set out and ready, and moved forwards to the fire before she was aware. With an alacrity beyond the common impulse of a spirit, which yet was never indifferent to the credit of doing everything well and attentively, with the real good will of a mind delighted with its own ideas, did she then do all the honours of the meal, and helped and recommended the minced chicken and scalloped oysters with an urgency which she knew would be acceptable to the early hours and civil scruples of their guests. Upon such occasions poor Mr. Woodhouse's feelings were in sad warfare. He loved to have the cloth laid, but it had been the fashion of his youth, but his conviction of suppers being very unwholesome made him rather sorry to see anything put on it, and while his hospitality would have welcomed his visitors to everything, his care for their health made him grieve that they should eat. Such another small basin of thin gruel as his own was all that he could, with thorough self-approbation, recommend though he might constrain himself while the ladies were comfortably clearing the nicer things to say. Mrs. Bates, let me propose your venturing on one of these eggs. An egg boiled very soft is not unwholesome. Surly recommended boiling an egg better than anybody. I would not recommend an egg boiled by anybody else, but you need not be afraid they are very small. You see, one of our small eggs will not hurt you. Miss Bates, let Emma help you to a little bite of tart, a very little bit. Ours are all apple tarts. You need not be afraid of unwholesome preserves here. I do not advise the custard. 
Mrs. Goddard, what say you to half a glass of wine, a small half-glass, put into a tumbler of water? I do not think it could disagree with you. Emma allowed her father to talk, but supplied her visitors in a much more satisfactory style, and on the present evening had particular pleasure in sending them away happy. The happiness of Miss Smith was quite equal to her intentions. Miss Woodhouse was so great a personage in Highbury that the prospect of the introduction had given as much panic as pleasure, but the humble, grateful little girl went off with highly gratified feelings, delighted with the affability with which Miss Woodhouse had treated her all evening, and actually shaken hands with her at last. End of chapter 3